March uh, 12th, and there's been a lot of interest in the Netflix documentary, M8370, The Plane That Disappears. Uh, a lot of people have been writing to me on social media, on my blog, um, on Twitter, asking me questions. A lot There's a lot of things that people want to know, clarifications. A lot of people are asking the same questions. So I thought maybe the most efficient way to deal with it would be to just um, kind of address some of the most asked questions uh, in this kind of informal video. It's kind of boring to just talk to the, the screen. Uh, so I've asked my friend Sarah Winter uh, to join and, and sort of have a discussion with me about these questions. Um, a lot of you will remember Sarah um, from her role as Kate Warner in the uh, TV show 24, where she found herself kind of thrust into this international conspiracy. So it seems like she's a perfect person to talk about this current weird conspiracy and all the theories that are swirling around it that we deal with in the documentary. And Sarah um, has been fascinated by this case for a long time. And I've been, you know, we've been talking about it with her for a long time. So I thought she'd be the perfect person to kind of just have a discussion about some of these questions. And Sarah, thank you for- oh, Pleasure, nice tie-in with 24, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I've never lived through a conspiracy, but um, I certainly played one out um, on TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like we've all lived through this conspiracy. And, and, and you know, the other thing I want to bring up, too, is that you are, in fact, Australian. Um, and, I, you know, I feel like that's do you feel like there's like Australians feel like a, a, a different relationship to I, M.A. Sony? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I'm an Australian. I grew up there and I feel like um, it hits a little. Sort of even more personal, you know, personally. Um, because uh, the Australians were involved in the in the recovery, um, in the investigation, um, along with Americans. Um, but yeah, it's just it has captivated me. I, mean, I can't believe it's been nine years and we still we still don't know what happened. Uh, and you know, I've known you for years now, and I I you know you're a journalist, so you're curious. It's in your DNA anyway, but you're also you're an aviator, you know, you, you understand aviations, you fly planes, you, you own a plane. Um, so I can really understand how you became sort of, you know, um, a person that people wanted to know your theories, wanted to hear you speak about it. And, oh my God, I have so many questions about, about this, this docu-series. Um, yeah. Well, I, I was sharing with you some of the things that people had asked me, and you have questions too. You actually came. We had a little watch party on Wednesday when it came yeah. out. You were, yeah, you were there. right. And it was it was fun because it kind of turned into a spontaneous um, question and answer session. Yes. So I thought maybe if we can share that with people because because yeah. people are asking like I, like I said up top like kind of the same questions. So I thought I had given you some of these questions and like maybe you could just kind of play the role of the audience and just sort of like ask. Yeah. What um, and we can talk. about only have interest in knowing more and you know often you you watch these shows and and you get answers and I have more questions than I exactly. than from the outset and like what people are asking me people that I know that are watching it who don't even know I know you are, are sort of curious in the first in the first episode there's um this is like 24 hours after uh, the plane went missing uh she talks about someone someone got a call from the, right that's the, right but there was no follow-up so what yeah what? that's 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 really the number one call um question i would say people are asking is like a, a passenger says this other passenger came up to me holding her phone saying oh it's my dad he's calling me what should i do and he and he says we'll answer it of course and but she does but then there's nobody there and this uh, people are like well how come they didn't like what happened? Like what did they, there must be a way to track the phone data, you know, what cell tower was paying, like where did it come from? And it's true that like when you have a call coming in like that, the phone companies have all the records of where the phone originated, what cell tower, cell tower passed through, like where the caller is from and all this, it's a wealth of information. So where is that information? And the answer is, a, we don't know. B, I doubt that the call actually ever existed. It's kind of a third hand story at this point. Um, and what did happen that was very intriguing was that, as we found out in the final Malaysian report, was that when the plane went back over the Malaya uh, Peninsula and went up the Strait of Malacca, it uh, passed over Penang. And as it passed, which is an island in the in the 
in the Malacca Strait. And as it passed over, it can a, a one phone on the plane connected with the cell phone tower. The phone was identified as belonging to the co-pilot, this young guy. Um, and no connection was made. It just was like connect. You know, the phones are sort of ping each other just to just to connect, just to signal that they can connect if they want to. So we don't know. It's a, it's mysterious. It you know it was it was used as evidence that the plane really was MH370. Um, but the fact that there was that one cell phone set of data suggests to me that that's the only one that they had. So I so so to answer your question, I think the reason why they didn't follow up on that piece of data, although I don't know for sure, but my suspicion is that there was no such call, that it was like a misunderstanding. And, you know, the, but I have to say this whole there was a lot of talk about, well, people there, there were all these reports about people calling the relatives phones and the like the phone, the, the call connecting, but no one answering. And people think, well, if the phone like it was ringing. And if it was ringing, does that mean that they they're actually the phone is somewhere? And I, I think the answer is no. I don't I don't think there was any kind of connection with these phones, except yeah. for that one phone connecting that with, with that one cell phone tower in Penang. Lots of questions. Again, yeah. like there's a lot. I've said it's been nine years and like the case is officially closed, but there's like still things to pursue, I think, usefully. Whether it will turn out just to be something, maybe, I don't know. How could it be closed? You know, we don't know. And this was a big plane. Can you, this sounds dumb, but what's the difference between a 777 and a 747? Triple seven, the, the 747, of course, was like the biggest Boeing plane. It had that sort of famous profile with that sort of double deck for the front half of the fuselage. Um, it first flew in the late 60s. It was like a very glamorous plane through the 70s and 80s. And then like it's it's actually just now kind of being removed from service. They actually just delivered their last 747 freighter like a week or two ago. So it's, we're really at the end of the era of the 747. The 777 is a newer plane. It was um, developed, I believe it first flew in the 90s, I think. This particular plane first flew in the 90s. Um, and uh, what can I tell you about the 777? It's big, but not as big as the 747. It's currently the, it's currently the biggest plane that Boeing makes. It's, so it's, it's a very large plane, but it's not quite as large as 747. But, but the fact that it's disappeared, it's not, it's not like an Amelia Earhart plane, you know, that just disappeared. Yeah. This was a plane, you know, that, I mean, how do you, I don't know. It just, it's so unbelievable to me that nine years later, we still, all we have are conspiracy theories, you know, we don't, yeah. so all we have are theories because we don't really have answers. And the other thing, um, I was wondering, and I was talking to a friend about who, you know, binged the series as well. There's a woman, I think it's Tom Nod, am I saying it right? Yeah, um, Tom Nod, right. Who, who found debris or, and and again, that wasn't followed followed up with. Yeah, I mean, she, they, they do kind of, she does have an appearance at the very end as well. Um, but the idea that this, this woman was very convinced that in looking at the satellite photo, she had seen the plane. Yeah. Um, and I think an important bit of context that the series doesn't give you, but which is true and important, which is that there was a whole army of people just like her. So Tom Nad had said to the public, hey, listen, we're going to let you look at the satellite data for free and just sit, tell us if you think of if you see anything. And so Tom Nod was basically a pipeline of massive amounts of satellite imagery that was being pumped out to the public. And each person was said, here's a here's a, here's a a frame of some random place uh, on, you know, presumably in that general area. And if you see something in here, maybe you have solved the mystery. So everyone was sort of highly motivated to see something. And, you know, if you've ever, you know, I, we, we're all familiar with this phenomenon where like you look at clouds, you looked at the patterns and like swirls of wood or something or, the, the Jesus is in a in a pancake or, you know, the Virgin Mary in a tortilla, the, all these things. Are, it's a it's a part of the, it's an aspect of the human brain. And so people like this. This woman, I think, was just a particularly aggressive one. But people like me who are like just sort of receptacles and people were like reaching out and saying, here's what I found. And people did actually really give useful information like Mike Exner did. Um, but these people were not useful. <laughs> these people were like a major hassle because every so many of them you had hundreds of people saying i found the plane and they would send you an image and it would be a picture of a of like a wave or like a smudge and you'd be like and they're like no this is can't you see it 
Can't you see? Look at her. Just look, look with your eyes. It's there. So this woman who's like, I'm fully, con she's fully convinced that she found the plane is one of hundreds of people who like also found the plane. So like the Gulf of Thailand or the South China Sea is just crammed with with triple sevens that have fallen into the ocean, you know? So it so it's it's see if you see her in isolation, it could seem compelling. When you when you realize that she's one of hundreds of people doing saying and doing the exact same thing, it gets pretty tiring. Right. Everyone, yeah, wants to be the one that solves the mystery, I guess. Um, I mean, guilty as charged. I mean, I'm the same. I, I'm in yeah. the same way. I mean, I'm conscious. I'm always conscious of like, I don't I, I don't want to be the guy who like grabs the theory and says my theory has to be right. 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 Um, you know, the, I think the trick, so, you know, one of the things about working on this on this mystery is that you realize how contrary to human nature the scientific process is. Scientific process means looking at data, generating new data, gener generating hypotheses, but above all, being willing to be wrong, like being willing to say, OK, this is my best guess so far. How is it wrong um, well, and, and how well, can I fix it? You're one of those people, though, you, uh, you know, you don't you know, have a theory and, and, and grip onto it for dear life. If you get contrary information or something else comes out, you take a step back and go, I could be wrong. You know, I'm, I just. It's nice of you to say that, Sarah. You don't have to be nice to me. You can. No, I... <laughs> um, and at least you come from a place of, you know, you have knowledge of, you know, how airplanes work. And I, I would like to think so. But and... you listen, a lot of people. CNN, you know, the horrible names because of this. A lot of people continue to call me horrible names. That's OK. Um, people feel very strongly. People feel very strongly. I yeah. feel very strongly. I get it. It's like it's an emotional thing. So it's always a challenge. I sometimes get angry people, too. And um, you, what I, we're all doing our best. But I like I, I feel like, you know, science is, I think, People tend to think of a, a scientist as like Albert Einstein, like single handedly sitting in the patent office in Bern and like having this insight. Science is a collaborative process. It's a conversation. People need to convince each other. People need to listen to each other. It has to happen in good faith. You have to have an open mind. You have to be willing to be wrong. Yeah. Nobody wants to be wrong. I don't want to be wrong. But, you know, we have to like. So basically what I'm trying to say is I have a theory. It's just a theory. Anyway. Let's we we can't talk too much because I think people are going to get bored. But um, yep. we can talk more. I would I, I would want to say to anyone who's watching this who's who's hoping to get an answer and their their particular questions are being answered. I, I would you know I'd like to kind of do this more of these as time goes by and sort of see and respond to people if people have any response at all and people want to ask questions. I you can write to my blog jeffwise.net. I'm answering people's questions. People are tweeting at me and I'm trying to answer things. This has to be a conversation. And so, and I'm only one person, but um, to the to the best of my ability, I want to try to engage people on this. Um, but so, I, I do, let's do a couple more. Like, if there's some other questions that people I, have, I and this is not boring. What what led you down the the path of the Russian connection? Um, that that's whole. interesting. Like, why did I think the Russian? No, okay. So the in the documentary, it says, and even I say, I, I, I don't remember putting it this way, but that's what it, I guess I'm saying, is that MH17 got shot down four and a half months later by the Russians. And then this made me suspect, well, if they shot down one Malaysian Airlines 777, maybe they shot down the other one. That's actually not how it happened. Um, I already had hired investigators in Ukraine and Russia in June, so a month before the shoot down, I had already hired people. And when that shoot down happened, I thought, oh, crap, I might have put these people in danger because they were investigating this shoot down, which now at the at that moment, I was like, OK, now it's obvious to what, what happened to MH370. I literally thought that everyone was going to simultaneously think, oh, the Russians obviously did it. Um, the reason to answer your question, which I haven't yet so far, why I, I start I suspected the Russians is because looking at the data, even the limited data that we had at the very beginning, the fact that this plane turned off its electronics six seconds after leaving the last Malaysian waypoint suggested someone who knew exactly what they were doing, where they were, wanted to act aggressively. They wanted to do that turn back as soon as they thought nobody was looking at them. So they knew how ATC worked. They knew how the plane worked. Um, they had a, they probably knew how search and rescue worked. 
Um, they basically did an aggressive turn that was too aggressive to, be, to have been carried out by an autopilot. It had to be done manually. Um, they accelerated and climbed, which is the opposite of what you do if your plane is on fire. So everything about the early part of the flight suggested to me that these are people who are sophisticated and highly motivated. And it seemed very, very strange to me that people with that, with those characteristics would kill themselves. And my suspicions were really accelerated when, um, and I, this is mentioned in the documentary, when the um, Malaysian authorities revealed that the that the this satellite box had been turned off and turned back on again. And as I think the documentary does a really good job of explaining, like that is not that is really hard to explain. So again, I was like, okay, are we talking about a hijacker who is more sophisticated than your average triple seven pilot? And so then I, I I started to think about, well, is there a way we can explain this incident that doesn't wind up in the Southern Indian Ocean? And and so, and then doing the math and actually, you know, Mike Exner, who exoriates me and is like, and sort of like calls me terrible names in the documentary and in real life and is still calling me terrible names. This, this on my understanding of the, um, the wiring of the 777 comes from him. Um, I could not have formulated this I, hypothesis without his knowledge. And so it's a little bit ironic. Um, so it all predates, to answer your question, it all predates the shoot down and actually is based on a, a weird aspect of this case, which is pretty technical in mm -hmm. its nature, but which I think is really important fundamental to this mystery. Wow. Um, you mentioned um, he's called you names. How has it felt, you know, being accused of being a conspiracy theorist and, you know, dredging up these outlandish theories. I mean, do you, is it hard to not take it personally or is it, because it seems to me as someone who knows you, it, it rolls off your back. You, you sort of. It, 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 I, yeah, my wife is always says like, oh, this stuff doesn't bother you. It, it bothers me. It's like, it's, it's, I don't like reading this stuff. Um, but it's kind of the price of entry. If you're going to have a, if you're going to try to change people's minds, um, then you're gonna knock some people's noses out of joint. And I get it. Um, it sucks, but it's part of the game. And like, if you're, if you feel that like these questions have to be raised, um, if you feel like there's real stakes at play, um, then you kind of have to go there. And listen, I mean, I, I, somebody asked me on a, on a radio show this morning, like, is this like your is this story your obsession of your life? And I'm like, no, actually, I have multiple obsessions, as you know, Sarah. I'm constantly like going down one rabbit hole after another. I spent as this when this mystery first started happening, actually, I was in the throes of another obsession, which was I was um I had um been covering this um kind of a psychopathic tech guru. Uh, named John McAfee, who everyone loved. He was kind of this um, Elon Musk type figure where he just did whatever he wanted and he had all this money and all these girls and he did all these drugs and everyone thought he was a hoot. And I knew I had actually been approached by sources who, who told me that he'd raped them. And I felt like, as with this story, I feel like there's stuff I know that I feel like the public really needs to know. Like this guy is not a good guy. Subsequent to my did, you know, writing an article about how he had like done some nefarious things, he actually killed somebody. And and that turned into a whole other story. It turned out he'd killed two people. Um, so, and that's, that. I mean, it, that's just one example. I like, I'm kind of obsessive. <laughs> but, but, but people are mean to me about that too. It's like all of the, he, McAfee was loved by his followers. Like Musk, if you've ever seen someone write something ne negative about Elon Musk on Twitter, like they attack, his hordes come out of the woodwork to attack that person. So that phenomenon is like, listen, yeah. if you want to be a journalist and you want to write about anything that isn't completely non-controversial, you're going to get attacked probably by a swarm of a combination of bots and just like obsessive whatever. I mean, listen, we're all trying to figure out how to live in the current, yeah. you know, information environment. You also have been on the other side of, you know, like looking at other people and, you know. Have like I attacked other people too? Yeah, I mean, I there's people in this world that I think are horrible and I probably have said so. Well, the, yeah, um, I'm not the only person. Hey, listen, I'm, I live in a glass house. What can I say? <laughs> but the guy, yeah. he's quite an entertaining character in the series that, you know, he was, um, someone coined the description, uh, he's like an Indiana Jones type, you know. That oh, Alan Gibson, yeah. 
and oops, here's another piece of wreckage. And and then he goes somewhere else and miraculously finds, you know, there are there are, it's not just this woman in Florida, it's people that really gained a lot of attention and um notoriety um within this, you know, search and investigation and you know, I can't imagine what it's like for the families, you know. I mean, the the there were, you know, hundreds of people of lives lost on this plane, but you know, I want to address that the point that you made, Sarah, about Blaine, because one of the reasons if you if <laughs> people accuse me of different things, like I have a, a crazy theory, my theory is crazy. Um, but that Jeff has like been horrible to Blaine Allen Gibson. And you know what? I kind of cop to that. I have said like really uncharitable things about Blaine Allen Gibson. And, um, and I, you know, the problem is that, you know, he has this background that I find suspicious and I've written about him. You can search my blog. I've read about him in my book. I explain why I find him. Some of it is in the documentary, but there's more. Um, and if this whole thing is a conspiracy, if this is like a Russian military action, and this guy's got this Russian background that he's lying about. You know, I you you kind of have to just like roll the dice and like say these things that are kind of un, kind of mean, frankly. And um, well, he's pretty but mean. But it's about true. Him. I have to say, you know, I have to say it. I don't know. Maybe maybe on my deathbed I'll be like, oh, that was terrible. I shouldn't have done that. But I don't. Know, I, but maybe I won't. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I I just I think we should wrap it up, Sarah, because um, yeah. you know, I just am a motor mouth. I just go on and on and on. And um, okay. um can I ask you one more? Oh yeah, sure. Do you think we will ever know what happened? Um, I do, actually. I do. I feel like it's like it's a crazy mystery, but I feel like we haven't really started in in earnest. I feel I feel like the, the entire um, establishment of of Australia um, has been has been they've got the dial set up to a hundred percent. We are a hundred percent certain that this data wasn't tampered with. And I, all I've been trying to do is get them to dial that down to 99%. Like imagine there's like a 1% chance that this data was tampered with. What are the results, like how should you be looking at the world differently? The, the entire media establishment has been taking a cue from the Australian authorities and from the independent group, which has been like sort of hand in glove with the, with the Australian authorities. So basically the answer is yes, I think we will find it. I think we need to start thinking about it differently. I'm hoping that this documentary will encourage people to like maybe take a deeper dive, look at it with like through a different lens. I'm optimistic. I think it's important. This is why I am kind of going out on a limb like I have, like talking about it, kind of, um, you know, doing what I can to have an open conversation about this. I would love to kind of see like a blue ribbon panel, kind of like they did after the space shuttle blow, blew up and have like leading scientists who are like really open-minded. There's a lot of people who could add a lot of expertise and offer opinions. Like, let's just have like a sort of an, uh, almost like a, a debate and say, listen, can we rule out, can we really say with 100% certainty that Jeff Wise's theory is wrong, that there, this vulnerability does not exist, um, and if so, if it is in the ocean, like let tell me tell me a story about how it could go in the ocean and and, and not have wound up in a place it could be found. Um, it's I, I feel like it's really important. Yeah, it is. Um, the families are owed some closure. I can't, you know, they have no closure. Nine yeah. years. I think that's so true. I think that's so true. Sarah, thank you so much. I'm hoping that maybe we'll, if people have any interest in this in this video, if, if people want more, I would love it um, if you would do this again with me because it's, it's really helpful to me. I would to, love it. Uh, um, we should get a panel going. I we could. Right. We could. Yeah. I mean, I would love to get like other other voices, people with expertise, people with other perspectives. Um, but let's wrap this up for now. And, um, you know, again, to, to any viewers who are watching this and and have st still questions that aren't answered or comments or perspectives or theories of their own that they want to they want to add, put it in the comments or whatever. I can I'm reachable. Um, and Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. My pleasure. OK, talk soon. Bye.